everyone. My name is Pat Somerville, Senior Partner and Head of Business Development here at Hamilton ETFs. As many of you know, it's been a challenging couple of years for Canadian bank stocks, leaving many investors asking themselves, is the worst behind us and when might the group begin to recover? Today, we're joined by Rob Wessel to talk about three ways the Canadian banks might clean up their Q4 earnings and potentially set the stage for an improved 2024. So Rob, as we head towards Q4 earnings for the banks, uh, what sort of cleanup items are you expecting to see? Yeah, so in September, we wrote a note on our website. Um, the title of the note was Three Ways the Banks Might Clean Up Q4 and Set the Stage for an Improved 2024. And the three uh, ways that we identified, uh, number one was restructuring charges. Uh, number two was writing down or selling assets. Uh, and number three is a top-up of reserve builds. Okay, so why don't we walk through each of those items? So let's start with restructuring charges. What are, what are you expecting to see there? Yeah, so restructuring charges is a staple of Canadian bank earnings. Uh, they're actually extremely common, been involved in the sector for nearly 30 years, uh, see lots and lots of restructuring charges. They're very common. They often are quite large. Uh, so what does that, what does that usually involve? Uh, it can involve a couple of things. The first and most common one is uh, downsizing uh, staff and employees, particularly on the capital market side, and booking severance charges. Uh, that's the first kind of character of a restructuring charge. The second one would be closing branches, any sort of rationalization, particularly outside of Canada. Uh, and the third one would be just selling uh, or exiting underperforming businesses and then booking against the cleanup cost for that. Okay, so for example, we, we've seen BNS announce some restructuring charges lately. We've also seen BMO exiting its retail auto fi financing business. Um, those appear like negative headlines. Can you talk about um, what that means for shareholders? Yeah, so I know that they, especially for Bank of Nova Scotia, because the numbers seem large, um, and I know that they look negative and, 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 and I'm not suggesting it's good news. Uh, but one thing I would say is that uh, what the benefit to shareholders is that you end up taking some severance charges and some booking some charges, but you reduce forward expenses. So typically the market looks through the one-time expense or what they see as a one-time expense and they start pricing in or, or valuing the expense reductions, which in many cases could be highly material. So for example, for Bank of Nova Scotia, a couple of the sell side analysts came out and estimated that the the EPS accretion that would come from this was somewhere between two and three percent, depending on which which analyst you read, which could be meaningful. Yeah, it's very helpful. Um, so, in addition to restructuring charges, can you talk about the second way that we might see the banks clean up Q4 earnings? Yeah. So the second way is writing down and or selling assets. So what might that look like? So the first one that we cited in our note was marketable securities with uh, unrealized losses, particularly in the U.S. banking subsidiaries, uh, where the accounting is held to maturity. Uh, you don't have to book the losses. They accumulate as unrealized, uh, selling those and, and recording a loss. Uh, the second way is maybe a bit more common, is writing down goodwill and or intangibles. Uh, the banks over the years have accumulated a lot of goodwill, uh, and that's one where they might look at the impairment of the investments or the acquisition. Uh, and write down some goodwill, which takes you to the third component of writing down or selling assets, which is actually writing down the carrying value of the investments. Uh, especially we, the one area we think might be the most vulnerable is some large wealth management acquisitions, which were made over the years. Uh, it's been a tough market for wealth management. So we think those three components of writing down and or selling assets are a very real possibility. So in didn't Royal and BNS make some recent announcements on, on this issue? Yeah, so Royal made an announcement which was uh, very economical. It was There was not a lot of detail, but the it, it, the substance of it was there was some intercompany transactions where City National, its U.S. bank subsidiary, not predicting City National in particular, but as we talked about selling uh, securities, uh, booking a realized loss, and reinvesting into higher yielding securities. As it relates to Scotia, they made some large write-downs for uh, carrying value of certain investments. So what does this all mean for shareholders? Yeah, so for this particular area of, of cleaning up the balance sheet and the income statement, um, the shareholders or the banks might benefit in the following ways. The first is um, in the instance of, of writing down uh, marketable securities with unrealized losses or realizing those losses because they can be reinvested in higher yielding securities, you can get higher net interest income and higher than interest margins, which you would expect going forward for City National, although we don't know the quantum yet. Um, the second thing is you would get uh, or likely see higher ROEs because uh, goodwill and intangibles when they're written down come out of the, come out of the equity box. Uh, and the good thing is, uh, for the most part, 
Uh, because goodwill is already deducted when you calculate regulatory capital, um, you can do these write downs of goodwill and intangibles and it has no impact on common equity tier one. Okay, so let's move on to the third way the banks could clean up Q4, which is topping up reserves. Yeah, so this is potentially the most material and the most significant. Um, so one of the things the banks might do um, is they might scrub their books or do everything they can do to find uh, ways where they can add conservatism uh, to their allowances, particularly against performing loans. So to the extent that they're able to build in a lot of conservatism or even more conservatism, especially given the uncertain macro environment, um, the better off they are. Now, this performing allowance is getting quite large. It's already back over 20 billion. It's approaching to the extent the banks are able to top this up this quarter. Uh, it might get, it get closer to the 24 billion COVID high. Obviously, COVID was a tremendous event and there was a lot of economic uncertainty during that. And so getting these current levels closer to where they were at the peak of COVID would seem to suggest that you're close to done. Um, what you would see if the banks were able to top up is that that would be six quarters in a row of reserve builds, including the most recent five quarters in a row where they built over $5 billion to this allowance alone. They might also do something on the impaired side, uh, but I think on the performing side, to the extent that they can build that even more, uh, that is something that we might see. And so why, why would that be a positive for the group? Yeah, so I, I think there would be a lot of benefits for shareholders, possibly. I mean, at the end of the day, what you're essentially doing is you're taking expenses in future periods and booking them now uh, to the extent that, that you're allowed. I think that would, the second benefit would be it would improve market confidence that reserve levels are so large uh, that, you know, the, the potential builds going forward uh, would be lower if not gone, which takes you to probably the most important benefit for shareholders, which is the extent that they can get this allowance to its maximum level or to the amount that's sufficient in, for in the eyes of the banks and the regulators it removes a very significant earnings headwind. Because obviously, if you're building this performing allowance, you've done it for five straight quarters, it's a very significant reason why the banks keep missing. It's a significant reason why earnings growth has been stalled. Not the only one. There's obviously lots of other things going on. But to the extent that they can get this allowance you know, up near or closer to its COVID high, and they did that this year, uh, and that could clean the decks or clear the decks uh, for fiscal 24, that sets the stage on a credit side for things at least to remove one significant negative or to, or diminish it. So it sounds like you're saying the worst Q4 is uh, that's possibly better for the banks. Yeah, for shareholders. Yeah. So um, if you think about it, you know the banks have three ways that they can clean up Q4 and set the stage for 2024. Whether it's as we mentioned, um, restructuring charges, writing down and or selling underperforming assets, or topping up reserves. All three of those together could be highly material. So why is that beneficial to shareholders? So the first thing it does is because it's pulling, in many respects, pulling expenses from future periods into current periods, or it's reducing forward expenses, possibly materially in the case of restructuring charges, um, you put upward pressure on earnings estimates. That's number one. Number two is you reduce earnings risk, uh, which brings you to the valuations of the banks, which are obviously very distressed. They're about 8.5, 8.6 times current and forward estimates. These are very, very low valuations. If things were fine, nominal GDP, GDP growth was sort of you know, moving along at 2% and there was no macro risk or, or it was benign, they'd probably trade it around 10 and a half times. So obviously you're two multiple points below what would be normal in a normal period. Obviously it's not normal right now. So if you're 8.5 times forward, that's the market telling, that's the market saying a couple of things. It's saying earnings volatility or uncertainty is so great, we're going to price in a big discount. But more to the point, it's probably more, they're looking at analyst estimates and they're saying, we don't agree. So the market doesn't agree with the analyst. We think the market, uh, that analyst estimates are maybe 20, 25% too high, uh, particularly maybe on credit. Um, we would say that's a very, very, very big assumption, not one that we would make. Uh, and so if you do any of these three or any or all of these three things, the chances the analyst estimates are are accurate and or even conservative is higher, which would mean the shareholders would have two possible avenues of, of share price appreciation. One would be earnings estimates are just revised higher, number one, or number two, uh, the banks benefit from multiple expansion because right now they're getting multiple compression. So if you add those two things together, uh, it could be a very good year for Canadian bank shareholders. And these three ways 
uh, are very common. Uh, we've seen them time and time again, and time and time again we've seen that they have their desired effect, which is cleaning up the year, taking, taking a year that's not that great, putting everything into it, and setting the stage for a better year. And I think you can see the early, early stages of that manifesting itself, and to the extent that that happens, you know, I think that could be very positive for shareholders. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Rob, and, and thank you, everyone, for listening in. Um, for more information on our ETFs and more Canadian Bank Insights, we'd encourage you to come to our website at hamiltonetfs.com.